so he had to use fuses like this. The idea is that you squeeze the top part here, which breaks a glass capsule on the inside, releasing acid that then slowly burns through a strip of wire. Now, when that snaps, it releases a spring which boils out, setting off the detonator. Now, this was very advanced in 1942, but there were a couple of problems. First of all, it was very susceptible to jolts and shock. You wouldn't, for instance, want to ram some lock gates at 25 miles an hour with one of these on board because it might go off instantly, killing everyone. It was also very vague. The strength of the acid varied from fuse to fuse, the strength of the wire varied, the tension of the spring varied. Tibbets couldn't say to within an hour when the bomb might actually go off. Choosing what explosive to use, however, was fairly straightforward. He went for Amatol, and to show how big a bang that produces, we've placed a pound of something similar between the front seats of this car. Three, two, one, fire in! That was a pound. Tibbets was going to use four and a quarter tons. Still, even if the explosives and the fuses could be trusted to work properly, and even if they could get across to France without being detected and up the estuary without being blown to smithereens, and even if the Campbelltown could hit the lock gates exactly right and the commandos could get off and do whatever it is they had to do, they still had a problem. How do they get home again? Because the Navy wouldn't provide a second destroyer, they were instead given 16 of these. Today, this Fairmile ML is a tourist boat taking trippers around Torbay, and certainly it's better suited to this than it ever was for Operation Chariot. They're made of Bakelite bonded plywood. It was a cheap mass production boat designed primarily to make the Navy look bigger than it really was. May God speed all who sail in her. It certainly wasn't particularly good in the open sea. It tended to roll badly in a swell which made everyone on board queasy. It's not so bad if it was only used to bring the soldiers home, but this little fleet would also be used to get half the commandos out to San Nazaire as well. So there'd be 15 commandos wedged down here with all their kit. And when they got to the other end, they'd be expected to get out and start fighting immediately. It's a jerry. There wasn't only seasickness to worry about, because while each ship had small guns fore and aft, it didn't have any armour. No, really. All that stood between the German guns and the men down here were, um, a few planks of wood. And to make matters worse, each boat was fitted with two 500-gallon long-range fuel tanks, which were completely exposed on the deck. Campbelltown was a bomb on purpose. These things, they were bombs by accident. Honestly, it's hard to think of any vessel less well-suited to the job in hand. The commandos were hard men, good fighters. But they'd been picked for their intelligence as well, so they must have known that the chances of getting to San Nazaire were small. The chances of doing the job were microscopic. And the chances of them getting home again on a wooden boat, groaning under the weight of exposed fuel tanks, past an alerted enemy, were virtually non-existent. They must have known that Operation Chariot, for the vast majority, was going to be a one-way ticket. We were all of us told if we wanted to leave a letter for our next of kin or our loved ones, you could do so. And you wrote on the envelope to be posted in the event of my failing to return. And that's one, Sergeant Bill Gibson, who um, I knew them all very well indeed. And I remember seeing his face and I knew he knew he was going to be killed. My dearest dad, by the time you get this, I shall be one of the many who have sacrificed their unimportant lives for what little ideals we may have. I can only hope that by laying down my life, the generations to come might in some way remember us, 
and benefit by what we've done. At a time like this, I turn to you, Dad, and God. I hope there will be peace for everyone soon. My love to everyone, I'll remember you. Your loving son, Bill. Somehow I thought it's unlucky to write your last letter to your parents. <laughs> no, my attitude was I'm coming back. Two of uh, men came to me and said, would you take these letters home to our wives? if we are killed. And I said, but wait a minute, I'm going with you. Oh, you won't be killed, I said. They were both killed. The San Nazaire raiders weren't allowed to reveal details of the operation to their loved ones. But for the bomb designer Nigel Tibbetts, recently married and the father of a young son, the thought of keeping his wife in the dark was too much. So he told her. And she said afterwards, they both sort of knew he wouldn't be coming back. So as the commandos gathered here in Falmouth in Cornwall, ready to join the Campbelltown and the little boats that were anchored out there in the bay, Lord Mountbatten gathered them all together and very unusually he said to them that any man who wanted to step down could walk away without a stain on his character. Not one of them did. At 2 p.m. on the 26th of March, 1942, the Armada set sail. With 264 commandos and 357 Navy personnel on board. That's a total of 621 men. Only 227 would come back. I had just enough uh, light to, to read the book that I, that I was, was, was reading, and I just concentrated on reading this book. The thought that crosses your mind is, I hope I'm going to be able to do my part, uh, you know, without being uh, overcome by, by fear. We chatted to each other about what we're going to do, and I, we all went through it with our blokes, you know. I, I and my four guys just went through what we were going to do. I certainly thought to myself, my God, I hope I'm not going to show fear in front of my men if I'm frightened. Tents, I suppose, would be the thing. Uh, anticipation, yes. Fortunately, I think we were more worried about it, the, the, it being rough, because uh, it's very, uh, as you can imagine, physically exhausting to be seasick all the time. But we were lucky. It was calm. 33 hours later, they arrived at the mouth of the estuary, and the captain of the Campbelltown, Lieutenant Commander Sam Beatty, instructed Tibbets to set the fuses on his bomb. He then began to creep up the estuary. Ideally, he'd have stuck to the deep water channel, the channel the Tirpitz would have used. But this would have meant hugging the northern shore right under the noses of the German sentries. So he had to go right down the middle, despite the fact that the water, even at high tide, was just 10 feet deep. To reduce the ship's draft, much of the heavy armour and the big guns had been removed. So if she did become grounded, she'd be a sitting duck. We did go across sandbanks a couple of times and dragged a bit going over. Um, but it was so quick that you hadn't got time to think, good God, if I'm marooned here, i would be shot to pieces. It's hard to know, really, what the German gunners in this pillbox were doing when the Campbelltown chugged by. I mean, yes, she'd been hurriedly converted to look a bit like a German ship, but she was trundling right down the shallows. You'd have thought that would have alerted them to the fact something was up, but obviously it didn't, because they didn't open fire. And nor did the guns at the next pillbox, or the one after